finale poate este grand finale for the marriage of the rock series and there is no better way to to cruise to that finale and you know that to enjoy a piece of music like this and thank god that youtube has made it possible that you don't have to go out and be looking for an lp or a 45 45 uh, 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 player you can always play this music just to have a dance pull your lover around just just create your own fun and memories that's what life is about memories created My dear baby sister Joy, I hope you are downloading this thing right now. You better start downloading it. Because next time you and I are going to talk, I'm going to remember this music and ask you how many times have you played it for my brother since we saw me do it online? <laughs> Don't be shaking your head right there now because exam examination day is coming, okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, we are quick to make a disclaimer that we have no copyright over that song, but I know Timmy would love every one of us to enjoy Thank You, Pastor Ken. I won't disappoint. Yes, 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 yes. I trust you. You know, I know uh, Timmy would love couples all over the world to enjoy this song, you know, and um, I think sometimes, you know, what we lack in the body of Christ is a sincere example of a marriage that is working. So it, it almost looks like a phantom. It looks like a mystery. Do, does marriage still work today? Yes, it does. Do we have any example of somebody that it is working for? Yes, it does. If there is, please let us let us know because it must be a far-fetched, mysterious person. There's nothing mysterious about it. There's nothing mysterious. Just like Tino and I, we love to play when we are together. When for reasons of work we cannot be together, we still look for ways to still play together. I'm telling you. Remember the other time I gave a teaching that if you are not having fun in your marriage, it's a recipe for disaster. And it's true because God meant it to be fun. Don't ever believe what the society is telling you that being single is the time to have fun. 
So they say things like this to you. Ah, better have fun now before you marry. As though when you now marry, there'll be no more fun. It's not true. Being married is the best place to now have fun. Real fun, unlimited, no holds barred, all sorts of fun. If my wife was here around me today, I would have been buffeting her life, trying to make her dance with me. And dancing with me is like trying to dance with uh, a masquerade from Benway State. You know, no style, no redeem. I just go all over the place. But you'll be laughing and beaming with smiles as she struggles to just fall across the room with me. You know, that's all it is. That's all it is. The bonus is when your children walk in on you and they see the two of you doing that thing. My daughters, they laugh and laugh. They look at me like this. Some of them will ask me, Dad, what are you trying to do? What dance are you trying to dance? Because we are just trying to figure you out. The way you are moving, it's like an octopus wrestling with another multi, whatever kind of animal in the sea. What are you trying to do? But the joy of it is that they can see their dad dotting on their mom, just loving and playing and sowing the seed in their heart that being in love, being married is a better place to have fun and to play than just being friends. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, my name is Pastor Ken and on behalf of my wife, Chino Asegeme and all the directors of the Faith and Family Leadership Ministries, both here in Canada and our supporting trustees from home, people like Apostle Israel Abam. I really want to salute that man for the strength and the pillar he has been to us. Reverend Samoyi, Pastor Tunde Adebayo. These are all trustees of the ministries in Nigeria. They have carried it and carried it until it got to Canada. And today we are enjoying the same pillar of support from people like Reverend Ambassador Paul Ondukwe, Dr. David Odigia, you know, and uh, Mr. Solomon Aboegbe, uh, Ms. Amanda Harriet Osindero, you know, and uh, uh, the great, great, great professor of uh, Dominion uh, Health uh, and Business, uh, you know, college here in Canada, the first institute with three campuses in Ontario. Reverend Testimony, Ariel Matoy, these are people that God has blessed us with to help us as trustees, directors, and people giving guidance to this ministry. So I, I want to assure you, you're in a good place. The reason these people agreed to put their pen to paper and have their names submitted to the government of Canada on behalf of this ministry is because they believe in what we are sent to do. And I hope you believe too. And for me, the key to prove that you believe is to start making changes. Every word you hear, don't just hear it because the hearing does not bring the blessing. It is the doer that is blessed, amen. And uh, for the month of November, we ran this series, Marriage on the Rock. You know how Jesus said in Matthew 7, that they that hear the sayings of mine, it shall be like a man that built his house upon the rock. All the vagaries of life came against it. The rains came, the storms came, the winds blew, everything beat upon it, but it did not fall. Why? Why? Not what happened to it determined why it kept standing, but what it is built on, on the rock. Then he said, there's another house built by a foolish man. And the foolishness of that man is that he did not apply what he had. He said, because he did not obey these saints of mine, he built his house as one that built on the sand. So the same vagaries came. The rain came, the storm came, the winds blew, and his house fell. Not because what happened to him was worse than what happened to the first house, his house fell because of what it was built on. It was not built upon the rock. And great was the fall of it. That will never be your portion in Jesus' name. Out of this platform, I pray the grace of God that the Almighty will give you a hearing ear and an understanding heart, a perceptive mind 
that what you have heard, you will not let go until you have eaten the fruit of feet, 30 fold, 60 fold, and a hundred fold. The God of gods, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb, said to tell you, your marriage is not a mistake. Your life is not a mistake. The valley is just his own moment to show up. When you come before the Red Sea, don't forget the God who you, whom you serve. He can part the Red Sea. He can make a way where there seems to be no way. When you have come to the end of your understanding, God said to tell you, don't even lean upon your own understanding. Trust in the Lord thy God with all of your heart. He will make a way. And in this finale to the teaching, Marriage on the Rocks, I pray that God Almighty will make a way for you. God will bring reconciliation to your home. God will answer to your heart cry. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ will reveal himself to you that he will let you know that I know you as a person. I'm not comparing you with any, any other person. I know you by your name and your circumstances, and I'm working on your case. May today become a day that will open the light of a new vista to you. Turn the page in the narrative of your love life. May you hear a word as the word sent from God. May you catch it and run with it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, I take authority over Satan and all of his cohorts. By the blood that has been shed several times and sprinkled us perfectly, I decree and I declare, Satan, you have no place over this life. I rebuke you right now. I take over the airwave. There is no distance in the spirit. Lose your grip and let the people of God receive light in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, 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 and amen. All right, let's get into today's teaching. And I would like to finish it under 90 minutes so that uh, when I mean finish under 90 minutes, finish the whole thing, Q and A, everything under 90 minutes. So today I want to talk to us about removing the little foxes or killer, marriage killers, removing the little foxes that I call the marriage killers. You know that old adage, the little foxes that spoil the vine. They might be little, but they are, they are wreckage. The damage that they bring upon the vine is humongous economically and every other way. So we have to be mindful of these things. So if you have a type that's right, please pick up your pen and paper. Let the journey begin. Number one, you have to understand that marriage has its life separate from the lives of the parties in the marriage. Marriage has its life separate from the life of the spouses. Please understand this, write it down, meditate on it. Let it sink into your heart. When you're about to enter into marriage with anyone, remember you are about to birth a new creation whose existence will be extant from your existence and the existence of that person you are negotiating with. It's important to know this so that if that other person is not capable of sustaining the support required for what is about to be built to stay alive, don't build with them. So please, write this down. Marriage has its life separate from the life of the spouses. Because this is true, it is also true that the marriage can die while the spouses are still alive. Because the marriage has its own life, 
The marriage can die while the parties are still alive. Whether by way of a divorce, by way of separation or jactications of law, by way of some strained and emotional, you know, disconnections, the marriage can die while the parties to the marriage are still enjoying their life. And you know what? In some very, very unique circumstances, the, the, a, a party to the marriage can die and yet the surviving partner will continue to honor and to nurture and carry on with the marriage. A party has died and yet the marriage is alive because the surviving partner is refusing to let go. So now you see what I mean by marriage has a life that is separate from the life of the spouses in the marriage. Marriage can die while the parties to the marriage are still alive and doing well. And in some exceptional and commendable situations, a party to the marriage has died and yet the marriage is still alive because the surviving partner is honoring and still holding on to that union. Yes, I understand how that the scripture says to us that marriage comes to an end when a party dies. So the marriage is sustainable until death do us part. But you and I, we are witness to certain exceptional individuals that didn't allow death to do their part for that spouse that was so good to them. So they lived the rest of their days in reminiscence, in honor and celebration of that party that died. If you ever remember the movie, The Titanic, I pray you didn't miss this little portion of the narrative that Elizabeth lived her life having the love of Leonardo DiCaprio who died, you know, in that shipwreck. And she never married somebody else. She carried that for the rest of her life. And I know several persons like that. I don't want to start calling names, you know, but my great friend, Chief Olisametu, you know, when his father died, one of the things that a lot of us around him and his sisters really celebrated was the fact that when that man's wife, their mother died several, several decades ago, the man refused to remarry. He rather spent his life to the mother and father to all of the children. This is not an occasion to praise any individual, but the principle is clear. Marriage has a life that is separate from the life of the individuals in it. Marriage can die while the parties to the marriage are still alive, and a party to the marriage can die, and yet the marriage is kept alive because the surviving partner is still honoring what they had. Therefore, let us take our discussion to the next level. Just like you eat good food to sustain your life and you select your menu so as to balance your intake, it's in the same way that the, um, that it's in the same way that the food for marriage is different from your own food. So you can be eating well, but the question needs to be asked, is your marriage well fed? You can be working out just so that everything can remain sharp. The question is, is your marriage well fed and exercised? So very quickly, I want to give you six recipes 
that helps to feed marriage with a balanced diet. Six recipes. Remember the trend of the conversation. I'm so sorry about that. I'm not sure why that happened. It has never happened since I moved here. You know. <clears throat> All right. Can you hear me now? Sister Joy, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? I All can right. hear you now. Yes, you can hear All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, so I was saying that marriage has a life that is separate from the life of the parties in it. And as such, the parties can die, the marriage will remain alive, or the marriage can die and the parties remain alive. And as it takes food to sustain you on the earth, we also need to understand that marriage has the need to be fed. So I want to give us six suggested recipes that can help you feed your marriage. Number one being communicating often. Not just communicating, but communicating often. Communication is the bedrock, the lifeline, and the blood of marriage. So communicating often and communicating well, quantity and quality is a required recipe to feed your marriage, not you. Say, Pastor, I'm a shy person. I'm very conservative. I'm a man of few words. That is you. Your marriage needs you to communicate to feed it. You're a man of few words, but you wrote volumes in your thesis to pass your exams. You're a man of few words, and yet you defended your project profusely and answered to every question required of you meritoriously for you to earn what you have today. You could do it for that job and your career. And I'm here to say to you, your idiosyncrasies, social limitations, they are no longer a good excuse to starve your marriage. Your marriage needs good communication, good and frequent communication in quantity and in quality for it to be fed, not you, not your spouse, but the thing between the two of you. The thing between the two of you, that marriage, it needs to be fed with frequent communication in quantity and in quality. This is very, very serious. And remember, I want you and I to come to that place where our love for Jesus, you say you love Jesus, and I have no doubt that you do. You say Jesus is your Lord, and I have no doubt that you do. But I need you to now come to that place where Jesus, your Lord, who is a person in heaven, is the same Jesus, the word of God, that is now here before you as a principle. Jesus, the person, is on the throne of God. But Jesus, the word of God, is here before you and I. Your allegiance to his person should be repeated in your allegiance to his principle. And in Luke chapter 10, from verse 38 to 42, Luke chapter 10, from verse 38 to 42, Jesus is in the house of his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and he's visiting. And the Bible says that Martha went into the kitchen and began to put together a very, very fantastic meal. And I can reckon with Martha. I can reckon with Martha. Sincerely, if you told me Jesus is visiting my house, I'm telling you, if I had to climb a palm tree to tap fresh pine wine for him, I would do it. I would do it. 
if I have to go to the seaside and cast my net to catch the biggest catfish to entertain him, I will do it. Do you, do you know what we're saying? Jesus is visiting. However, Mary, we are told, instead of taking the time away from Jesus' presence to go and prepare something for Jesus, she sat beside Jesus and they began to communicate deeply quantity and quality, animated conversation. Tete a tete, they'll come out bursting in laughter, then they'll go quiet again, and they were there. And they were there for such a long time that after a while, Mary, uh, Martha was agitated. And she came out and said, Lord, Rabbi, there's a lot to do in the kitchen. And my sister is sitting there, I hear you guys giggling, I hear all the talks, what's going on? Could you ask her, as a matter of fact, she said, command her to come and help me in the kitchen. And here's what Jesus' reply was. Martha, Martha, you are worried, you are kimbered about so many things, but only one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that needful part and that better part, maybe has chosen it. And you want to know how destiny eventually played out? Martha was not the one at the graveside when Jesus rose. She had no clue, she was cooking. It was Mary that knew. It was Mary that got to the tomb because of the close communication that she had with Jesus when he was still alive in the flesh. At a point in time, she mistook Jesus to be a gardener. Then the Bible says, there's a unique way Jesus used to call her name. So Jesus called her name in that unique way that nobody else calls her like that. And when he said, Mary, she knew only one person calls me like that. And she turned and said, Rabona. And Jesus said, don't touch me for I've not yet ascended. Go and tell my brethren that I have risen from the dead. There is something that good communication does for your marriage. It feeds it. It feeds it. There is something invisible, indescribable, priceless that ensues between two people when they really, 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 really talk. Can I tell you the aberration that is going on right now? You know what I'm saying, but the aberration that is going on right now is that a lot of you have carried this portfolio of this one thing that is needful, that Jesus said is far better than everything else. You carry it and you have carried it into the bosom of friends, of a colleague at work, of even a sibling, and that is the person that knows the real you. That is the person that knows your real heartbeat. That is the person that knows your real fears, your real pains, your real joys. When you have been with them and you have had this kind of deep conversations with them, your day is made. You practically now return to your marriage with the sense of a satisfied person who does not mind what's going to go on in that marriage. So you come into your marriage with, all right, let me come and meet with this uh, cow and blockheaded idiot that I'm married to. What is it going to be like today? Anyway, if you, whatever you want to do, I really don't care. I've had my feel. My cup is full. I've filled it when I went outside. My brothers and my sisters, it ought not to be so. Your marriage is what you are killing, starving it while you are feeding yourself. May the Lord give you understanding in Jesus' name. Recipe number two to feed your marriage. Acknowledging the good things that's in your marriage. It is feeding the marriage. Acknowledging the good things that is in your spouse and in you, in that marriage, it is feeding the marriage. 
Please, I want to address every headmaster, every boss lady that is in this place, coach and dictator that is listening to me. You are the one killing your marriage. You're starving it to death. The way to feed your marriage is the same way scripture recommends to feed your faith. In the book of Philemon, some say Philemon, only one chapter, so chapter one and verse number six, the Bible says that the communications of thy faith becomes effectual. You are releasing faith towards God. You are releasing, releasing faith for something. That communication of your faith becomes effectual to bring result by the acknowledging of all, not most, all the good things that is in you in Christ Jesus. You can't fight Satan the day you are saying, I'm a wretched sinner saved by grace. You are either saved by grace or you are a wretched sinner. You gotta be one, you can't be both. You can't fight Satan that way. You can't fight Satan the day you are saying, I don't know if I'm holy enough and God will hear me. You can't, you can only fight Satan when you are acknowledging all the good things that's in you in Christ Jesus. Like the apostles did in Acts chapter three, you know, and in verse 12 to verse number 14. He said, why look ye on us? As though by our own power or by our own holiness, we have made this man to walk. Say, be it known unto you. It is not our power, it's not our holiness, but it is the name of Jesus. Faith in that name, even the faith which is by him, has given this man perfect wholeness in the sight of you all. What am I saying? To feed your marriage requires that you deliberately, intentionally, Draw up your scorecard and talk about the good things that are in your marriage. Please hear me. To keep your gear on neutral in this matter, it doesn't work. To say, ah, Pastor Ken, I understand what you're saying. You know, but thank God, the kind of a person that I am, I don't, I'm not even the complaining type. I just let things flow. You are still a bad person in that marriage. You are not feeding the marriage. Neutral. Not complaining is okay. Not complaining does not feed the marriage. What feeds the marriage goes beyond not complaining. What feeds the relationship is going further to make acknowledgement of the good things that is in that marriage. For some of you here, and you need to repent. The only time you speak concerning your marriage is when you have something to correct. The public has never heard you talk good things about your spouse. The only time they hear you talk about your marriage is when you have something negative to bring. Your siblings, they have never heard of any good thing that your spouse has done for you. The only record in your family is the retinue of all the things that your spouse has done against you. Even when they have now been forgiven, your family has refused to forget. You are the ones having the marriage. To feed your marriage, you must talk about the good things that's in your marriage every now and then. You know, when your spouse is in the kitchen and the other friends are with you in the living room, you should talk about him. Let him hear you bragging on him. Yeah, let him hear you bragging on him. That's how you feed the marriage. You are not feeding his ego. Those are side effects. You are feeding the marriage. The marriage is fed when we are acknowledging the good things that we have even between us in that relationship. This does not negate what needs to be done, what has not yet been done. But for the marriage to be alive and sustained until those things are done, this is how you feed the marriage. Recipe number three. Be quick to repent when you have done wrong to one another. Be quick to repent when you have done wrong to one another. It is feeding the marriage. Don't be that person that says, oh yeah, I know I've done something wrong. It's just that um, if I speak when things are still hot, I may say the wrong thing. That's you. That's you. Deal with it. Deal with it. You are starving your marriage. The key to feeding your marriage is not waiting until you are comfortable to talk about it. The key to feeding your marriage is you repenting quickly. You don't say, oh, 
I know I've hurt her now. I, I know what I just said right now didn't go down well, you know, but oh my goodness, I can see her face. She's still fuming. Oh my goodness. Let me just allow her time to finish what she's doing. Who knows, maybe later tonight, uh, when everything has calmed down, she's had her bath and all of that. Maybe that's when I'll now bring it up. Can I be frank with you? The time you allowed is also a time it will fester. It's also a time allowed for demonic spirits to go and whisper to that your enemy. It's also a time for spoilers, spoilers to step into the heart of your spouse and begin to magnify and escalate, exaggerate whatever it is that happened. But you know, the moment the spirit of God strikes your heart that that wasn't right, be quick to repent. I said, honey, honey, I'm sorry. I, 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 I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Sincerely, I, I'm sorry. I don't know how else to say it. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Quickly. Quickly like that. Quickly like that. If you had reliable news that Jesus is coming, you know, in an hour's time, and you committed a sin on the traffic in 25 minutes' time, which now leaves like you know another 35 minutes to the coming of the Lord. Are you sure you keep that sin in your in your in, in your bosom? Won't you quickly say, Lord, I just messed up on the traffic. I'm so sorry. I know you are coming soon. I don't want to be left behind. Live each day as though it is the last. When you do, when you do, when you live each day with your spouse as though it is the last, you give birth to new days, to new days, new times, new memories. So be quick to repent. This is the purport of scripture. When you see Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, saying to you, be angry, but sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In modern colloquialism, all he was saying was, be quick to repent. You know, because I've heard people ask me, okay, pastor, I have a question. The Bible says, uh, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. What if the matter started after the sun has gone down? So how do we calculate it? No, 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 no. The principle in our modern colloquialism is don't stew on the matter. Don't waste time. As soon as you are convicted that something is wrong or you did wrong, repent very quickly. It's not about you now. You are feeding the relationship. You are feeding the relationship. Recipe number four. I have only six of them. Recipe number four. Let me move a bit faster. Recipe number four is services. When you serve, you are feeding the marriage. When you serve each other, you are feeding the marriage. Serving one another, both to provide and to protect you are feeding the marriage. When you will not allow your ears to hear something about your spouse and you take it lying down, you are feeding the marriage. Hear what I'm about to say. Even when what they are saying is true of his character, feed your marriage. Stand up and protect that your spouse. Malakabashina. Feed the marriage. Providing for your partner, spending on your partner, you are feeding the marriage. You are feeding the marriage. You are feeding the marriage. It's not right that, uh, uh, no, I, I, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'm still on seven, not spending. Serving one another is feeding the marriage. The union is better when it is the union of two servants 
you know, struggling to serve one another. You know, the other day I saw my wife comically, you know, um, uh, illustrate this in, in a conference. She said, even if what the husband has done is to help throw away the dustbin, go make a loud force about it. Ah, come and hear my husband. Igwe, the king of kings and the lord of lords, he has done it again. And then when they ask you, so what did he do? Ah, he threw away the dustbin. <laughs> Why? Because men, just like women, they respond to praise. When you serve one another, you are feeding the marriage. You're feeding the marriage. Do it for him, not because of him, but because you are feeding your marriage. Do it for her, not because of her, but because you are feeding the marriage. Number five, spend on each other. It's a recipe. It feeds the marriage. Spending on each other. It's a recipe that feeds the marriage. And I want to read to you a feature, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, but I want to read it from the Amplified. Matthew chapter 6 <clears throat> and in verse 21. Not the Amplified classic, but the first Amplified. And in verse 21. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, your desires, that on which your life centers will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your wishes will be also. Where your treasure is, there your desires will be also. Where your treasure is, there that which your life is centered on will be also. Spend on one another. It has nothing to do with the price tag. Spend on one another. Yeah, yeah, I, I know some of you here. And I said that my wife is working, she earns her own money. My husband is working, he even makes more money than myself. So where you really want to spend on is on the children. You are wrong. Your children are growing well, and we thank God for that, but your marriage is starving. Not your spouse, not you. You are both working, but your marriage is starving. But when you spend on yourself, then the marriage begins to grow, begins to be okay. Why? According to this scripture, where your treasure is, thank you, IK, where you are putting your money, there your wishes will be. So your wishes will be on that person. Then your desires will be. It's not a matter of the perfume or their haircut. Your desires will follow your treasures. He said, there, that which is the center of your life, will also be there. Spend on one another. I love my wife. I mean, I, I love her. She, she, she's my friend. She's my kind of a person. Do you know that when we're dating, she was in the law school and I was working with the chambers in Area 3, Gariki, for those of you that know the geography of Abuja. And I would write a note and give to someone who perchance came to our chambers and says they have a matter taking them to law school Buhari. Then the roads were not very good. And I'll write a note and give them and say, please, when you get to Buhari, help me look out for this sister. Hallelujah, sister Timuke. Hallelujah. <laughs> and sometimes I may have given that note to the person at about midday. Then interestingly, about an hour or two later, somebody comes by our chambers and they say, we have a letter for, for you from one sister Tinuke in the law school. And I'm like, yes, thank you. Oh, can I have it? And my first inclination is that she got my letter. So she's replying. But by the time I read the content, 
and now discovered that she has not even seen my letter. So our letters cross themselves in the way. It is as we stand in on one another that our hearts are kept on one another. Our desires are kept on one another. That which are the center of our lives fixate on is on that other person. She had not read my letter. She just woke up that day and also wanted to write to me. Spend on one another. The price tag is not the issue. It is the heart. For those of you again that are used to Abuja, you know the barbecue chicken in Abuja. I think it sold the, the main, the main whatever is 1,500 uh, naira, which is less than, um, which is less than uh, $4 here in Canada. But you know what? I found that it that needs to do magic on my wife. You know, as a matter of fact, if you want to kidnap my wife, it's very easy. Just tie a barbecue chicken on a rope and then be pulling it. She will run after it. Hallelujah to Jesus. Oh my goodness, she's here now. I didn't see that. She's here. But it's true. I, that thing that is less than $5 on my way home, I'll stop by. Buy it, put it in a nylon bag. And when I get home, I should say, welcome. Thank you, honey. We always hug each other when anybody went out and is returning home. And I'll say, here. And you know what? It will change the atmosphere of the whole house. Why? I brought a gift of less than four Canadian dollars, less than three dollars US. So all that really mattered is you had me in mind. You had me in mind. And that's me. I spoke with my elder daughter, you know, a while ago. She said to me, uh, one of the things she doesn't like right now is that she has to order her shawarma and pay for it. That she was so used to me having to pay for things when she wanted something. I said, yeah, me too. I miss you. I <laughs> God says it's easy to kidnap <laughs> my wife with barbecue chicken. <laughs> oh, don't worry. She has grown no? now. That barbecue chicken must carry a check of $1 million for so her to follow you. <laughs> but the point is this, and I said to my little daughter, I said, you know, I miss it too, that I'll buy things here and I have to eat it alone. I'm not used to that. Sharing was our culture. What am I saying? Feed your marriage. Mar Please remember how we have come in this, in this conversation that marriage has a life separate from the life of the spouses. The marriage can die while the spouses are still alive. And in, in other cases, the spouse can die and yet the marriage will be alive because the surviving partner is still honoring what they had. So as you feed yourself well to sustain your life, you must also know that your marriage needs to be fed. So we are articulating on the six suggested recipes to feed your marriage. Number one, being communication. Number two, being acknowledging all the good things that you have. Number three, being quick to repent when you have done wrong. Number four, service to one another. And I said this, number five, spend on each other. The last one is physical touch. Be spontaneous, physical touch. If you are walking past the person, just touch them. I know we all wait to hold hands when we are entering an event so that everybody will see us as lovers. That is okay. But that in the scheme of things, that carries one, one point out of, out of 100. I'm talking of you are just passing her by in the kitchen and you can just you know, rub her head, run your hand over her hair. Just, just touch yourselves. Don't just be too far, living like two entities that the government is forcing you to live in the same place. When you sit together, let your legs touch. Raise your legs and put it on the other person's lap. And you, when they put legs on you, don't start complaining. Ah, this, my trouser, is very new. Are you all right? Your trouser is new. That's for you. But this marriage needs to be fed. When they put the legs on you, grab the knuckles and start cracking them. Start pulling, start doing this, start doing that. 
when you are near yourself, you tickle yourself. You know that Catholic thing. That's the feeding the marriage. You know how the scripture puts it? It says that laughter doeth good like medicine. Not just medicine for your body, medicine for the marriage. Now, if the above is oxygen to your, to your love life and to your marriage, we must also now consider the CO2, the carbon dioxide, because we're taking oxygen and then we must breathe out carbon dioxide. So the, the little foxes, the proverbial little foxes that spoil the vine, they are marriage killers that you and I must intentionally, like vigilantes, we must get rid of them. And there are several that the Lord has laid on my heart to share with you. And I'll take them very quickly. Number one, write this one down. This is the topmost of them all. Not taking responsibility. Not taking responsibility. And here is what I mean. It is always your partner's fault. It's a marriage killer. I, listen, even if you divorce that person with that mindset that you have, that you never put the searchlight on yourself, you never own up to your own aspect in the matter. You never so much as take responsibility for a modicum of the fraction of everything that has happened, but rather you roll it all on your spouse. Everything is your spouse's fault. You are the killer in the marriage. You are killing the marriage. You are killing the marriage. That kind of an attitude always kills relationships. Hebrews and in chapter 3, verse 4. Hebrews and in chapter 3 and in verse 4. The Bible speaking says that every house is builded by some man, but the builder of all is God. God is the builder of all great marriages, but somebody on earth must be here to take responsibility for it. Somebody on earth, you and I, we must take responsibility for it. I know you feel you got married to Satan's cousin. It doesn't matter. I know you feel like most of the whatever that happen is from your spouse's end. The point I'm making is this. Looking at it from just that point alone, it will never heal the marriage. It will kill it. The key to saving the marriage is for you to put the search light momentarily on yourself and take responsibility for your own part. If it was not what you initiated, how you responded. Take responsibility for your part. Number two, marriage killer, abuse. Whether verbal or otherwise, being abusive, calling your spouse, you fool, idiot. You are very stupid. It's not Christian. A lot of us did it in the, in the days of our ignorance. It's not Christianity. It's not Christianity. Do you know what Jesus said in Matthew and in chapter number five into six? He said, when you call your brother fool, he said, you stand in fear of judgment. If you call him raka, you stand in fear of hellfire. It's not Christian. It's not Christian. And for some of you, whether because you live in Canada, you live in Trinidad, or you live in the United States, you bring F words into your marriage. You bitch, F you, you this, you that. You are killing the marriage. You are killing the marriage. Yesterday, you know, Saturday night, I was ministering in the city of Guelph and I got to meet with this wonderful couple. And the while we're still exchanging pleasantries, they traveled from far to come and attend that conference in the city of Guelph. You know, some people else who came from the same city where they came from, those ones they slept over in the city of Guelph to attend the Sunday meeting, but they just came attended the Saturday and then went back to their city. The while we were chatting, their son, about 10 or 11 year old, just came home the dad. And I was like, hi, little man, what's your name? He told me his name. And then I gave him a handshake. I said, my name is Kennedy. 
And this little boy looks up at me and says, I like your name. My goodness. My goodness. He won my heart. Won respect for his parents. He won my heart. Let me tell you, your children cannot know how to speak peaceably outside when they are surrounded with your toxic abuses. They won't. The world. I mean, I met a lot of great people in that in that weekend with the couples, but that now left me with an indelible mark. The young boy said, I like your name. He was social. You know how Jesus at age 13 he could sit with the with the with the elders. That's how this boy made an impression on me. Stop cursing. Stop abuse, abusing abusive words. Some of you, you go beyond even your spouse and start insulting their parents. Start insulting their pedigree, their family lineage, everybody. As far as you are concerned, I was upset. Please hear me. When was the last time you were upset and you walked into an army barracks and you said, who is the commanding officer in this place? And when they pointed him to you, you just went to him and gave him a slap. So okay, I'm upset. When I begged like this, I just slap soldier. Let's stop the use of abusive languages. There are better ways for you to express your disgruntled, your upset, your irritations without becoming abusive in your language. Do you know how the scripture puts it? In James chapter 3 and in verse 9 and verse 10, James chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 10, the Bible says that how is it that with the mouth with which you bless God, with that same mouth, you curse the man that is in his image and likeness. <coughs> and the Bible says, this thing ought not to be so. Can a water spring bring forth hot water and cold water? No. No. Let to bless. You know how Jesus said it in Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes? He says, when you are reviled, do not revile back. Rather, bless. When they slap you on this side, say, turn the other side. He wasn't saying that you might be able to withstand slapping and slapping. What he was saying is, don't curse back. It destroys our children when they watch dad and mom in a cursing bout. You are an idiot. Your own father is an idiot. You are talking to my father. Your, your, your mother, your great grandmother, all your whole village, they are a bundle of idiots. And sometimes your toddling children whose emotions can handle this when you are doing it, they start crying. They start crying because they're wondering. This life is not safe. Our parents are cursing themselves. It's like feeding poison to the marriage. Stop abuses. I'm not even going to the place now of saying physical abuse. I'm saying stop even the abuse at the place of verbal. And for those of you that abuse emotionally, avoid all abuses, verbal, emotional, physical, financial, sabotaging, under, undercutting, spoiling your spouse before everybody else that knows them. Stop all the abuse. And God will give us healing in Jesus' name. The third marriage killer, affairs. Affair. Affairs. Whether physical or emotional or uh, platonical. And I will explain. Stop all the affairs. Whether it is physical, how, be, becoming sexual and all or emotional, there is no sex, but there's a lot of things going on, or even platonical. This person is just your friend, nothing sexual, but they have become the friend that you have used to replace the friendship you could not build with your spouse. It's still an affair. It's still an affair. Whether the person is of the same gender or opposite gender, it's still an affair. 
Stop it. Do you know why? The scripture was speaking to us in Luke chapter 16 and in verse 13. The God who created our human metabolism said, it is impossible for you to serve two masters equally. He said, it is either you will serve one and you will hate the other, or you will love one, you will despise the other. So you cannot serve God and the mammon. It's in the same way I'm saying, your eyes cannot be on the affair and yet be completely on your marriage. Your money cannot be spent on the affair and yet completely take care of your marriage. Your emotions cannot be attached to that person in the affair and you are yet completely in intimacy with your marriage. It's impossible. God Almighty is standing on his word. You can't. He said, no, no, no. Pastor, I don't have to play it equally. You didn't make yourself. You didn't make yourself. See how the Bible puts it? It says, the eye is the light of the body. When it is single, the whole body will be full of light. But once it is divided, it said the whole body, not part of it. The whole body will be filled up with darkness. You are the one who doesn't know that we know that you are being attached to somebody else. You are the one who thinks that the way you are doing your face, the way you are doing your this, that you have convinced us that you know, nothing is going on, unknown to you. Inside us, there is a knower sensor. There is a knower sensor that can tell them, oh, with all of this, whatever, something is already gone amiss. You know, uh, for some of us, we just pick up our phone. You know, we have direct dial to turn down lightning. You know, they work for us. And I just say, turn down, where are you? <laughs> you say, oh, God, ah, chairman, let it work for us. I say, yes, let me give you the coordinates, latitude 32, not. And then uh, longitude 45, southeast. <laughs> go, 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 go and kill somebody for me. I know that's a joke, but stop the affairs. Repair what's wrong in your home. Repair what's wrong in the relationship. Replacement never develops the real person. Once you replace your spouse, your, your, your marriage is not developed. Once you replace them, it's no longer developed. You say, I no longer rely on my spouse for money. Ah, you don't know how long I've been praying. Their breakthrough is still not coming, but God has just given me favor that this man that, you know, Whenever I'm in need, nothing between us, nothing sexual. He's just kind like that. Once I'm in need and I just call him, he just say, how much is it? Don't explain, don't explain my baby, don't explain how much. And he'll just wire it. Let me tell you, as long as you are collecting that wire it, you can never pray for your husband's breakthrough or for your marriage to be lifted. You're a liar. You're not praying for your spouse. You are, you are sorted. You are in an affair. It is, it is sorting you out. I know you are going to bombard me with questions, but so let me have my full day. I have just five more minutes. Number four, marriage killer. Finances. Yes, I agree. No, fin no romance without finance. Therefore, come together to structure what your financial program for the marriage will be. You need money for the romance of that marriage. Come together, don't work apart. You do your own and I do my own. Yes, you may be rich, I may be rich, but the marriage is poor. Let's come together and resolve three things. Number one, spending wisely. Number two, saving aggressively. Number three, giving generously. Let us agree on it. Let's come together and decide. 24 hours is what the whole world has to, to, to fulfill destiny. So let's come together on how we are going to invest our 24 hours, then agree on three points. How we will spend wisely, save aggressively, and then spend, gener give generously. What do I mean? Never remove God from your financial arithmetics. Never remove giving from your financial organogram of things or strategy. I'm not saying this to compare myself with anybody, 
but there's a widow that I take care of and I consider it an honor. The honor is so flattering because sometimes what I spend to get a phone for my children pays the school fees for the whole year for all the three children. And yet when she's gonna make the request, you see all the begging and all the water bars that will precede the begging. By the time I check the amount, I'm like, ah, is, it, is it this amount that's making her beg like this? Who are you pouring into? Mark, Luke 6, verse 36. This is spiritual economy that you must tap into. He said, give, give to God, give to your men of God. Give to those who are underprivileged. Give and it shall be given back unto you. Good measure of prayer and shaking together and running over when God caused men to give back unto your bosom. You know why? Proverbs and in chapter 11, verse 24, Proverbs 11, verse 24, it says that there is he that scattered and yet he's always tending to increase. And then there's he that withholded much more than it is meet. And yet, with all the savings, is always reducing. Spend, decide on the financial redemption and liberation of your marriage. Number five, killer. Not co-owning your children, not jointly raising your children. It's a killer. Don't split up over your children. Co-own them and raise them jointly. It is improper that when one spouse rebukes, the, rebukes a child, right in the presence of that child, this other party is opposing. And why are you being so hard on him now? You think you are being nice to that child? You are killing your marriage. Yeah, but pastor, you don't understand. My husband is so high-handed. He is so tough. He's so this. Who are you? Who are you? Jeremiah chapter 1 and in verse 5 concerning that your child said that before that child was formed in your womb, God, God knew that child. Before that child came out of your womb, God is the one that decided that this your hard husband and you the soft woman is the one to give birth to this child and it is the admixture of this hardness and this softness that will give this child the proper equipment for destiny. And for some of you, you even go worse than that. You run your spouse down to your children. Run them down. Yeah, the children might like you, but you are killing the marriage. And you're not going to marry those children. You're killing the marriage. And it's time to stop. Two more killers and I stop. The sixth killer is immaturity. Please hear me. Grow up. Uh, 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 uh. No excuse. Please grow up. Please grow up. Who you were when we married you 20 something years ago, you can't continue to make us to struggle with the same thing. Grow up. Please grow up. Uh, uh. Nobody should grow up for you. Nobody should contribute to your growing up. Grow up yourself. Your immaturity is costing too much. Grow up. Do you know how the scripture puts it in Hebrews chapter 5 and in verse 12? Hebrews 5 and in verse 12, it says that for the time being, when you ought to have become teachers, when you ought to have grown up, you are still there like a baby needing someone to give you the elementary understanding of scripture. When you were a child, you wore a bib, we're happy to feed you. But when are you going to wear an apron and begin to feed others? grew up. Paul was speaking. He said, when I was a child, I talked, I talked as a child, understood as a child, and I thought as a child. When I became a man, please hear me. He didn't say, the Lord delivered me from childish things. He said, I put away the childish ways. Growing up, Maturing is your responsibility. It's something you do for yourself, by yourself, and then we that are around you in the family and in the marriage will now enjoy it. It should not be that the older you are, the more you talk, the more cantankerous you are, the more you cannot overlook any slight mistake 
you have become so dictatorial, bitter, and toxic that people are looking for ways to run away from, from your present. Please mature. This has nothing to do with age on the calendar. This has to do with bearing the fruit of the spirit. Lastly, kill and marry that we must remove. Abandoning the word of God. Abandoning prayer. Abandoning fellowship. We need to get rid of these little foxes. I know for some of you, you have matured in the Lord so much right now that you can go without reading the Bible for 20 years. You have matured so much now, you no longer need to pray in other tongues. You have matured so much now that you no longer need to go to church. As far as you are concerned, you are the only one that the pandemic is still affecting. It's just that it doesn't affect you when you are going to the store. It only affects you when it comes to going to church. Please wake up. Abandoning the word, it will ruin the marriage. It's a killer. Slowly, but it is a killer. Abandoning prayer, praying together, praying for one another. I keep saying this thing. Praying together, the person you pray for, the person you pray with, the one you pray to, you develop an affinity with them that cannot be gotten any other way. Here's how the scriptures put it. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 19, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 19, he said, having faith and a good conscience, which some haven't veered away from, they have made a shipwreck of the faith. The more you fellowship, the more you grow in your faith. He said, I know God is personal. I can reach God anywhere. Online is available. That's not the plan. He said in Psalm 133 that when the brethren dwell together, that's where he commanded the blessing. He now said again in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Go back to church. Go back to your unit. Go back to praying together. Go back to saying, honey, which scripture are we reading this week? My darling, that prayer that we are praying, what, what, what promise are we standing on, by the way? Can you remind me? Go back to doing those same things that we used to do as baby Christians. He said, like newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, so that your marriage will be secured thereby, so that the immunity of your marriage will grow and all of these killers will be expelled even from you. I close with Psalm 81 from verse 13. And it is repeated in Isaiah 48 from verse 18. Psalm 81 from verse 13. God says, if my people would only do it my way, if they would only obey me, I would soonest have blessed them, prospered them, caused their enemies to bow before them. I would have fed them with good wheat, and the best of honey out of the honey, out of the rock. When we do it God's way, we get God's benefit. This is how God has asked me and enabled me to bring you this teaching on marriage on the rock. Your marriage has 100% chance to succeed. You are the one reducing the percentage. And today I pray that this last a class concerning this subject will resonate with you so much that you go back and listen to it. You make notes, internalize them, and begin to make adjustments. So that as we come to the last month of the year, the year 2021 wants to end, I want you to finish strong. I want you to finish feeling and knowing that your marriage is better. Even if all the great adjustments came in the last week, but you got it right. And 2021 did not weep or whoop your marriage, but you succeeded and you are finishing strong. That is my heart towards you and my prayer. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. We still have about nine. Oh, thank you, honey. Thank you for the hand clap. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate that. Thank you so, so, so much. You know, uh, so I, I want to ask, can we um, 
do some of the questions. Thank you, Sister Joy. I appreciate all the applause. Thank you, uh, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Homer. I appreciate you all. Thank you all so, so, so much. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, any question? And my beautiful agave bread, it just slides and chop. No need for butter or jam. She's in the house. Hey, I wish she even smiled. The matter is worse on me. Hallelujah to Jesus. Okay. Only please don't over smile too much. You get torturing me for body like that. Okay. Yes, any questions, please? <laughs> Uh, Olola Day, you know your mommy has been trying to catch you with questions. So, <laughs> all right, honey, take it away. I have also the Q and A. Hallelujah. Well said, Uncle Joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, honey. Well done. Well done. Fantastic. I mean, these are practical steps. Very, very, very practical. So. Maybe it's not a question, maybe it's a contribution, maybe it's a clarification. What don't you understand? What do you wish was said better? Well, Lady, I see you. Do you want to ask a question? Don't be shy. No, you are not, you, are, you should unmute yourself first. The system is muted. Okay. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, good Pastor T. Pastor Ken. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you, sir. Um, I don't want to say where I'm still contending is where you said that when you have a maybe like a friendship, maybe either a male or a female friend outside of your marriage, then you're having an affair. I really don't understand that part. So is it that outside the marriage, one can have like, I don't want to say like a life, like, okay, you have friends that you bond with or people that you've known for a while and then you still relate with them. Mm. So I don't understand how that is an affair. Mm. I, I'm glad you brought it up. I, I'll let my wife throw in something like that. Mm. Okay, so life, life, God, um, God is the originator of relationships and is a very relational God. Like I always say, that we went to school, we met people, male and female, and it's actually a sign of immaturity if you do away with your friends because you got married. But you, you know, and I know, that there is a level that some friendships get to that they become a danger to your relationship. When that friendship becomes your go-to, when that friendship becomes your... Um, solution center, when things happen in your life, and it's this person you want to speak to first before your spouse, it's an indicator that something is wrong. Now, we don't want to go into how we got into such a situation, because we must acknowledge that many times spouses push us, you know, into whatever becomes of the marriage. But I believe all this um, pointers are revealers for things you should watch against. You understand? It's so, it's sometimes it's even familiarity. Oh, my spouse is there. I could always run for stuff by him. Sometimes you are more with your colleagues at work. Do you understand? For example, people who live in Lagos, you leave home at five or four in the morning, you don't come back home till 12 in the midnight. So your entire life is with your colleagues. And that was when they recorded the worst of adulterous and sexual relationships in the bank. When that life was going on like that, nature above the vacuum, you must be intentional. We have, our temperaments are different. I am a people's person, but what I know to do is not to desecrate my marriage. No matter who I'm relating with per time, I am a boundary-oriented person. I don't want you thinking, oh, because I am friendly, I am playful, that you can gain access to me. No, there are certain things you should not have access to. Why? One, I'm married. I am a married woman. That is my identity. When I was a girl, I could do certain things. Being married does not stop me from being friendly. But he put barricades 
in what I can do and what I cannot do. Do you understand? Uh, in all fairness, my husband is far more accountable than I am. He's the kind of person I will buy bread and tell you I bought bread. But yet I'm very boundary oriented. I know what I can do that will hurt the marriage. I will not do it because I'm hurting him, hurting our marriage, and dishonoring God. So it has nothing to do with my temperament. My temperament, I'm a people's person, extremely playful. But how have I checked that? It is putting boundaries. So nobody say you can't have friends. Nobody say you cannot relate. But we are saying honor God. Honor your vows. Honor your spouse. Respect yourself. If these four pillars are put in place, I tell you, it's a roller coaster. And another practical point I put out there, draw a larger circle around your marriage. Nobody can stop. I can't stop my husband from relating with women. He can't stop me from relating with men. But we deliberately put a larger circle around our marriage. If somebody is getting close to me and I'm uncomfortable about it, I mean, now I'm matured enough. I must be honest, at the beginning of our marriage, I didn't understand it. But now I've come to know it experientially. Anybody that is a threat to our marriage, the person's got to go. You must put that marriage as priority. It must be on your front burner. And let your world know this. There is no relationship I can't let go of in protecting my marriage. So I will keep drawing the larger circle, draw my husband in, draw my, you know, keep letting that person know if the people are wise enough to respect it, you continue. But some people, they come with a clear agenda. I don't want your marriage. I don't want your husband. It's you I want. And I'm sorry, I'm not available. I'm married. And if you're you close to me, I want to introduce you immediately to my wife. Oh, I want you to be yes. close to my wife as well. Yes. You know, if you can't... So that way we are not suspecting. We are not. My husband has a daughter in America, Canada that is it's his daughter. She's his daughter. On a good day, people are paranoid. Once you see a female species around a male species, your mind is above. The devil takes over your thoughts and they just begin to feel, no, as long as there is constant, this is what's going on. I'm saying this person today, I'm picking up this thing. Maturity is a big point for your marriage. Let me stop there. I hope I've helped you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Yes, yes, but I also have like another question. Oh, what yeah. if the spouse, what if one spouse doesn't believe in the other person having like making friends with the opposite um, sex? Communication is the key. Communication is the key. I've come to know it that my husband put it this way oneness is not sameness. Many of us are not the same kind of people. My husband is a great risk taker, I am a zero risk taker. Trying to drag me into his risk life is just going to kill his business side. I'm not a risk taker. I was not grown raised that way. It would be unfair to say he can't have risk taker friends who their life is about taking risks. How is he going to grow his own idea of business? It's not who I am. Do you understand? So it's unrealistic to say that we will not relate, communicate, talk about it. Let your spouse know why this person is important in the journey. At the beginning, they may not see it. Let it be, raise it again. Especially if you know by your spirit that this person was called by God for the benefit. The truth of the matter is, there are some relationships you're just gonna let go of because your spouse don't understand. Because when you make a vow, it's the journey you have begun. And if you lose it today, you may gain it tomorrow. I agree it can set you back. I agree. Especially if that person is not able to comprehend what you're saying at the time. It's part of the sacrifice that the marriage requires. You know, uh, thank you so much, Honey and Ololade. Well, yesterday in the, in the Toronto uh, Forum, Somebody said one of the things she can't talk with her husband safely is because when she talks to her husband, 
his reaction is usually just so negative um, uh, and all of that. So she had to look for somewhere else to be able to have that kind of conversational frame. You know, and I said to them, even when that is the case, don't stop. Whatever is wrong between the two of you, keep treating it in the arena of us. Don't let it, don't replace each other. Keep treating it in the arena of us and we. Praise God. Any other Thank question? You. And that will be the last. It's 1.32. Any other question? And that will be the last. I can't see the hand. Uh, any other question? Okay. Uh, Jude, you have a question. Good evening, Pastor Ken. Hi. Good evening, Pastor Tino. Hi. Okay, so this is Joy. I. I can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, but I'm looking for you on the screen. Where are you? Okay, so I'm, um, um, I can't oh, okay, show my okay. video. I see Sorry. you now, I see you. <laughs> okay. I okay, so uh, for me, I was, you know, I was just thinking, I wish my husband was here to hear a lot of these things. And um, it would, it would, it would fast track the, finally you know, it would fast question. track the, I finally you know, asked the question. Yeah. Uh, it would fast track the, you know, the, the journey to, <laughs> Um, I you got mute victory now. and all of that <laughs> you know so but um so what do we do a lot of times i come here not like he's opposed to listening it's just that um, the timing may not be favorable and um, all of that and i know that there's power in two you know so it's me coming every week every week listening you know i was sharing with a friend of mine who's also here these messages are not to be taken for granted. I know personally, personally how it's helped me. And I find myself in a place that I relish so much. And I know that it cannot be me doing it. It's come from a place of um, acceptance and um, willingness to allow God help me. And then a lot of it is based on the things that I'm hearing here. And I honestly want to thank you and um, Pastor Tino for all you're doing here. But then the question is, Hobby is not here to listen for himself. A lot of times when he's here, we're, we're listening together, but he's not here, you know, a lot of times too. So what do we do? Sometimes it can be trying, you know, so you're the one hearing it, you're the one putting in more of the effort. And for him is, um, okay, we'll just be going and be going as we're going, you know, but hearing a lot of these things too help to helps to put things in perspective and then point you in the right direction. So what do we do? Is it enough to just listen and trust God to continue to help you? What's, you know, I'm just, Pastor, Pastor Ken, I'm sure you know what I'm trying to say. I don't know. Yeah, I'm I know, it. I know. Uh, sincerely, the labor to make marriage better is, uh, is far more fruitful when the two parties are engaged, you know, and because it's online, <clears throat> one of the advantages that we can appropriate is to go back to the Facebook line, send it to the spouse, who knows? If timing is the reason they couldn't be on the platform, ah, honey, this thing was discussed to do and I knew you would have liked it. Don't say it as though uh, there was judgment passed on your case. No, I knew you would have liked it if you were here. You know, so I, I just forwarded the link to you now so that at your convenience, you can, you can sort of, you know, watch it. And uh, if you have any questions, maybe you and I will now discuss it, you know, later. I, I just really wanted you to hear what I heard, you know, uh, and see, you know, uh, what you also feel about it. And uh, number two, we keep praying for that other partner. The heart of the king is in the hands of God. You know, uh, somebody here in Canada said to me, Pastor Ken, I, I, I get upset sometimes when I come on your program and I thought I'd done something wrong. I was like, wow, how could you be getting upset? He said, yeah, because what you and Pastor Tinu have, I, I just realized I, I can't have it. I said, no, you can. This is 22 years of labor. You've just been at it for eight years. There's still time. 
you know, to redeem what you have. It may start, it may be slow, but there's still time to redeem it. And uh, yesterday, another question came up and Dr. David, one of our directors here said something. You that has attended, go back and do something different and sweet. Treat the other party in a manner that they do not deserve, in a manner that they do not deserve, in a manner that they do not deserve because of what you are learning and that might begin to draw them to come and see and receive from where you are also receiving. But I acknowledge your, uh, identify with you, my dear sister Joy, it's better when the two parties can come. It's a couple's meeting. It takes a couple to marry, not one great woman or one great man. And it is a lot better if the two can come and God will do it for us. That's his promise. He said in uh, Acts chapter 15 and in verse number 16, write it down. Acts 15 and verse 16. He said, again, I will come and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, which is your marriage and my marriage. And I will restore all of its ruins and I will set it up again. In other words, he had done it before, then he collapsed again. They said, I'm coming again. I'll, I'll take him and set it up again. So let's trust God for this promise that he has given to us. Praise God. Our time is up, and that's the last question that we can take. Honey, do you have any final comment? Yeah, I was just going to say to Sister Joy that yeah. I always give the um, illustration of how enduring mothers particularly are regarding their children. Mothers just never give up. So I'm just going to beg you to have the same attitude towards your spouse. He's observing all the good things changes and he may do like he can't see what I tell you he's saying it one day you would see it too. Um, you become the change you want to see whatever it is you want to see in your marriage you become that change it's, it's a grace you please become the change you want to see in any area thank you hallelujah Carol says wow a principle I never thought of in marriage and relationship where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also going to be. Francis C.K. says, both spending and communications are very much essential. Lord, help me. Uh, Ogome says, it is easy to kidnap me with roasted fish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, awesome word. Uh, Adeko Risola says, amen and amen. Great session, sir. Lola De says, and thank you, Pastor Ken, my dear sister Joy says, thank you all so much. Um, Francis says, I'm grateful for this word I've heard tonight. And I'm grateful that you took time to attend. On behalf of my wife and the leadership of this ministry, I thank you for coming. And I keep saying, if you're on Telegram, go and down if you don't if you're not on telegram go download it the beauty of telegram over whatsapp is that on whatsapp groups you only see what is posted after you join but on telegrams you can see what has been posted before you got there when you get to telegram search for faith and leadership uh, institute faith and leadership institute there's uh, a link there to join add yourself and you have access to all our previous uh, meetings. If you need private counseling, you can always reach me on 416-409-0566, or you reach my wife on 0803320-8862. Our times are heavily demanded upon, so the private sessions are paid for. That will make sure that you get your money's worth. You know, so until I come your way again, pray hard, pray hard, pray for this ministry, ask God, how he would want you to participate, contribute your prayer, contribute your finances, and be a part of this growing army. God bless you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the God of Israel defend you. May God prove himself to you as you stand upon his word this week. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, may your marriage remain on the rock. May your relationship remain on the rock. May your heart and your fellowship with God 
remain on the rock. May no weapon fashioned against you prosper. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen and amen. All right, people. God bless you. Love you, my honey bunny. Thank you, Ogome Aduna. You're good to have you. Ishinom, Eudora, good to have you. And uh, Francis, E.K., Sisi, Ochai Audu, Ijeoma, and my dear sister, Ayobami, Shola, Bami Bade. Thank you, Betty Ann. You're good to see you. Taiwo, Grace, and Olola De. Ihoma, my number one to join. And our main man, who is always working behind the scene, Ibidun. Thank you so, so much. I didn't see to, uh, Tosin Babalola today. Somebody please give her my love. Sister Carol, thank you for joining us. All you from Trinidad.